Hey guys and welcome to another video in my series of videos on statistical physics and in this video uh, we're going to be carrying on with our partition function good stuff. Um, this we In the last video we, we derived this equation right here, the n particle partition function which is pretty useful because uh, you can apply it to a system of n particles which is good because that's a, typically the sorts of systems that we're going to be dealing with in um, the, in in statistical physics, and so uh, from this z term right here, um, we can actually derive lots of really cool stuff. So now that we've done all this hard work on doing all this derivation right here, um, we can use those magic box relations that we talked about in the last video. I'll quickly go through them again, and we can get things like the internal energy and the heat capacity and all sorts of stuff like that. And hopefully later on in this video. Uh, I'm going to then go on to derive a thing called the equipartition theorem, uh, which is all about how energy is distributed in a system. Um, it's actually pretty cool. So let's let's go ahead and do it. So what should we do first? Well, let's go and do the internal energy. So what is the internal energy? Well, it's U, it's the total amount of energy in the box. And I said that this was equal to the negative derivative with respect to beta, remember beta is the uh, inverse temperature, of the log of z, uh, where z is the partition function. So let's go ahead and substitute in this equ equation for n, uh, for z, sorry, into here. So what are we doing? Well, we're simply differentiating with respect to beta uh, the log of z. So we're going to get quite a big. Uh, quite a big expression here, but thankfully a lot of it will actually reduce. Um, so we've got 1 over n factorial, and then we've got all this v over h cubed 2 pi m over beta to the 3 over 2, uh, all of which is raised to the power of n and then close the brackets. So yeah, got a few nested brackets in there unfortunately. Um, so what are we doing? Well, so what do we do next? Well, we can separate out, um, we can't quite differentiate yet, it's not quite simple enough, but we can at least separate, uh, using the log laws, uh, this out into two different components, one over n factorial um, multiplied by uh, the log of this term right here. Um, remember, I'm used simply using the uh, log of a b is log of a plus the log of b. Uh, so yeah, sorry, that should be a plus right there. Um, so log of one over n factorial plus, and if you notice, you've got this n right here on the top. So I can actually um, put this n down and then bring that in front of the log. I know I'm doing a few steps uh, all at once here, um, but this is literally just um, just the algebra. Nothing too important. Um, but yeah, hopefully you guys can see what I've done right here. I've simply brought the n down and I've got log of this term right here. Uh, but we can go further. We can actually go ahead and separate out this um, separate out this expression. So we've got the ln of 1 over n factorial plus n. Uh, and we're going to get another two terms right here because we've got uh, the log of a product. So we're going to have that term or the log of that term plus the log of that term. So we're going to have n log v over h cubed plus n log of 2 pi m over beta. Uh, so and then we that finishes off that bracket there. So we separated out this uh, separated out the partition function or log of the partition function. Um, and now we're pretty much ready to differentiate with respect to beta. Um, now as you can see, we've actually only got one term which actually has beta in. So what's going to happen to all these other terms? Well, they're not going to carry through on the differentiation. So when we differentiate, we've got this minus sign out the front. Let's keep it here. This term isn't going to do anything. Uh, this term isn't going to do anything. So we're simply going to have the derivative of with respect to beta of n times the log of 2 pi m over beta, because all these other ones are just gonna they're gonna go. Um, there's there's nothing with respect to beta. So let's go ahead and differentiate. So we're gonna get a minus n out the front. That's a constant. Uh, okay, so let's differentiate. 
Um, so what what happens when we differentiate a log function? Well, we're going to get whatever's in using the chain rule. We're going to get whatever's in the uh, in the log on the bottom. So we're going to get two pi m over beta. Um, oh, sorry, I think I've missed out a uh, three over two somewhere. I'll just put that in. That should be three over two up there. And therefore, when you separate out the uh, logs, that should be a three over two. So, um, so actually, this should be three n over two because when that comes out, that will just come out the front of that log term. Um, so yeah, sorry about that. Three n over two. Uh, just put that three n over two. Keep that going. Uh, so yeah, two pi m over beta on the bottom, and the derivative of one over beta with respect to beta is simply um, minus 1 over beta squared. So uh, I'll just write that out. So d by dx of 1 over x is simply minus 1 over x squared. Uh, of course, we're going to have some constants in there as well. So the 2 pi m is just a constant. Um, so we're going to get minus 1 over beta squared. So 2 pi m's just go completely. Uh, we can cancel out that beta with just that one there. So we've only got a a one, so actually we've only got a beta term remaining. So we've got the minus three n over two. Oh, the minuses go as well. Um, so you see a lot of stuff cancels out actually. So we're actually not gonna end up with a very complicated expression, which is what you'd hope. Um, so three n over two, and what have we got? We've got one over beta. So that's all that survived is this one over beta in here. Um, so you're probably thinking, okay, cool, what's this then? But remember what beta is. Beta is simply one over KBT. And now you'll start to recognize what it is. Three N over two KBT. Now that should look familiar to you guys. That is the energy for an ideal gas. Um, if you remember in my video on uh, thermodynamics, I derived this result that U is simply three over two N KBT, or I think I expressed it as N little n RT, where R is the gas constant. Um, but look, we've derived it in exactly the same way using statistical physics. And yeah, and, and that's brilliant because uh, that shows that statistical physics agrees with thermodynamics and the two theories match, uh, which is really cool. Um, and so these ma this magic box relation worked and we have hence got the internal energy of a of of a gas, which is is fab. So and from this internal energy, you can clearly see that if you differentiate with respect to the temperature, uh, you'll get that. Um, CV, the heat capacity, is 3 over 2 NKB, which is 3 over 2 NR, which is exactly what we got before for an ideal gas. So um, so again, that's a nice, nice result, and it shows that statistical physics and thermodynamics do indeed match up. So, so I'm now going to go on to derive what's called the equipartition theorem. So I'll just write that out, the equipartition theorem. And before I get into it, I'll just kind of tell you what it is, because you're probably thinking, what the hell is the equipartition theorem? Um, it's basically saying that all of the energy is distributed equally among each degree of freedom. And what do I mean by degree of freedom? Well. When we were talking about the motion of gas molecules, I said that they could either move in a sort of up and down uh, direction, uh, a left and right direction, or a back and forth direction. Um, and each one of those dimensions, if you like, is a degree of freedom. So for an ideal gas, uh, the ideal gas has three degrees of freedom. Uh, and that's why we kept on seeing this number three everywhere, because there was three um, three degrees of freedom, uh, and therefore, um, and therefore, this had to be this energy had to be shared equally between each of the three degrees of freedom. Uh, so, for example, if you're in only two dimensions, then you'd only have uh, two degrees of freedom, and so therefore, 
the internal energy would look very different. Um, uh, but with statistical physics, the nice thing is is that you can derive it with um, any number of degrees of freedom. Uh, whereas if you consider it using thermodynamics, you can only derive it with three degrees of freedom. But if you uh, do it with statistical, you can get the uh, result either way. So we're going to now derive the equipartition theorem. And to start with, we're going to go back to this Hamiltonian idea. Uh, and we're going to consider a Hamiltonian. Um, and the Hamiltonian, basically, this is a very general Hamiltonian. Uh, so it's a function of position and momentum. Uh, and it's going to have the form. And it might seem a little bit abstract at first, but you'll see why I've written it like this in just a sec. It's basically going to have the form of a of a quadratic equation uh, with lots of squared terms. Um, and so let's just go ahead and write it as this. Um, so I'll explain what this is. So x is basically the x component of position. Um, and you're going to get a y squared term. Um, and you're going to get a z squared term. Uh, oops, sorry. And what this a, b, and c these are just coefficients at the beginning and it doesn't really matter that I've called it something squared it's just a constant but for convenience sake I've just decided to call it uh, a constant squared so a b and c are just constants uh, we don't know what they are yet but actually it will turn out that they become completely insignificant they just help with the maths at the early part of this derivation uh, but x y and z they are the uh, position coordinates, the familiar three dimensions of space um, of x, y, and z. So here we go. Um, so that's our position terms, but we also said the Hamiltonian has momentum terms as well. Uh, if we think about the example I gave with a harmonic oscillator, this had a momentum term uh, and a position term, which were both uh, quadratic terms. It was p squared over 2m, which was the, which was the kinetic energy and the position function was half m omega squared x squared for the harmonic oscillator. But this is just basically a general form of, of a Hamiltonian. So I'm going to keep on writing. Uh, let's choose r, s, and t as our constant. So we're going to get r squared px squared plus s squared py squared plus t squared pz squared. So again, really don't worry about what these constants are for the moment. They're literally just weighting factors and they won't have actually any significance in the long run. So, yeah. So here's our Hamiltonian. Um, so how? what do we do next? Well, if you remember our big formula for the canonical partition function uh, for, uh, actually, let's just do one particle to start with, um, and then we can generalize it to n particles by raising it to the power. So the partition function for one particle is, if you remember, it was this big, a hex hex duple integral is that what it's called um so one over h cubed uh just to keep the dimensions correct um and we have our six integrals over all of phase space uh, remember we're doing it for just one particle uh so yeah so we're integrating the momentum over over from minus infinity to plus infinity in the previous derivation for the ideal gas, we were simply integrating over the volume. But since this could apply for anything, um, this could apply for any sort of free gas, we're actually going to be integrating over all of space. So we're going to be integrating over the whole of phase space. So all x, all y, all z, all px, all py, all pz. And all of these range from minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, I'll just say for clarity that r cubed is simply the range of minus infinity to plus infinity um, and in three dimensions and which is why the three is there. So here are our six integrals and we're going to integrate um, this exponential factor, the Boltzmann factor e to the minus beta h um, with respect to all three position coordinates and all three momentum uh, coordinates. So yeah, so uh, let's go ahead and substitute in our Hamiltonian into this equation. All right, there we go. So here's our Hamiltonian. And 
what if you remember what we did in the last video we used our law of exponentials which basically says that e to the a plus b is one and the same as e to the a multiplied by e to the b so you simply can split up this exponential into two uh, two separate exponentials uh, that's true of anything it's not just true of e um, but just you know we happen to be doing it with e so um, so yeah it, this is our law of exponentials and I hope you guys can see that we've got six terms in this Hamiltonian right here um, and so we have a if we expand this bracket out if we try and imagine that this this bracket expanded out we're gonna get e to the minus beta e to the minus beta a squared x squared plus minus beta b squared y squared plus beta minus beta c squared z squared and so on and so forth so we're going to get up get end up with uh six terms up in this exponential right here and using this rule right here we can split this whole term up into six different exponential terms and in doing that, we can actually break apart all these integrals. Um, so we can break this apart. Uh, we can break these integrals apart because each integral is going to be only over its respective coordinates. Um, so um, we'll just go ahead and write this out. So we're going to have 1 over h cubed. And we're going to get six separate integrals all multiplied, by, all multiplied together. If you're a bit uncomfortable with this step, that's fair enough. Um, basically it's an integration property. I've kind of done a few steps all at once, but I did do them in the previous derivation for the partition function. So, um, I'm not going to go through in too much detail because it is just the maths, but basically I'm using the law of exponentials and I'm using the fact that you can split apart integrals by multiplying the integrals together, which is a well-established um, integration rule. So I'll just go ahead and write all these terms out. So here we go. Here is our very, very long, um, our, our long term for the one particle partition function. Um, so yeah, we've got six integrals to do, but it's actually nowhere near as bad as it looks because if you remember in the last video I stated the standard integral result that the integral between minus infinity and infinity of e to the minus a x squared this a is not the same as this a this a it's just a constant um, that I've dreamt up is equal to the square root of pi divided by a so that is a standard integral result. It's called the Gaussian integral. Uh, we used it in the last video. So uh, we're going to be using this result on all six of these integrals right here. Because as you can see, they're all exactly the same. It's just all, all the terms are labeled slightly differently. So let's go ahead and apply it to all of these. In Let's go ahead and apply this. So we're going to get 1 over h cubed. Um, now, now what are we going to get? Well, for all of these, we're going to get a square root of, let's just put this 1 over h cubed, we're going to get a square root of pi, that's going to be common to all six of the, all six of these integrals, and we're going to get a divided by beta, because beta, if we identify the constant term, uh, let's just take this one integral, this little term I've highlighted in blue corresponds to the a in this integral. So we're going to get a beta. Beta is common to all of these integrals right here. So we can factor out this beta uh, out front. And since this term is exactly the same for all integrals, we can raise it all to the power of 6. Okay, we're going to have 6 integrals and each one of them has a root pi over beta. I know we're not done yet, we haven't considered this term here, but basically this is common to all of the integrals and I've simply just added them all up separately. So I've, I've kind of jumped another little step here, but I hope you guys can see what I've done. Um, this bit is just, it's just the algebra, it just saves having to write out all these integrals again, which is a bit of a faff to be honest. And so, yeah, um, but we're not done yet. We're gonna also have a, 1 over uh, the square root 
of all these constant terms, one over the square root a squared, b squared, c squared, r squared, s squared, t squared. So this is exactly what you'll get um, if you performed all these integrals separately uh, and then sort of factored out all the like terms. So yeah. So here's what we got for the one particle partition function. Um, and for the n particle one, I simply said you could just raise it all to the power of um, all to the power of th of n. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's raise each of these terms to the power of n. So we're going to have 1 over h to the power of 3n this time. Um, what's going to happen to this? Uh, what's going to happen to this guy right here? Well, the square root of something to the power of 6 is basically just saying the square root of this cubed. Uh, is basically is basically just saying cubed because six um because this is all square rooted and if it's raised to the power of six then the six gets divided by two to get three so um and we're also raising it to the power of n so we're going to get pi over beta to the power of three n okay and this term right here well uh this is all under a square root so this is all raised to the power of one half um, and so if we raise it to the power of n, we're going to get a squared, b squared, c squared, r squared, s squared, t squared to the power of n over 2 right there. So I've simply distributed this, I've raised everything to the power of n and then split this n up into these three different terms right here. So yeah, but, 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 but. This is not quite right yet because we need to include our 1 over n factorial um, because we said, remember, that particles are fundamentally indistinguishable. And so therefore, this 1 over n factorial term has to be added. Uh, it's actually called a name. It's so important. It's called the Gibbs factor. And, it's ex and I explained what it does in the last video it basically corrects for the overcounting mistake because if you do, uh, if you don't include it, then you will have counted uh, the same uh, states twice, and so therefore uh, you won't end up with the right predictions. Whereas if you do include it, then you end up with the right, uh, the right thermodynamic predictions. So yeah, very important this one over n factorial right here. In fact, actually, I'll just write that z n is simply z1 to the n divided by n factorial if the if we're treating the particles as indistinguishable which they are so yeah right so there we go here's our expression for the partition function of this random uh random hamiltonian that we uh that we said which was a function of all six uh coordinates so this doesn't look that great, does it? I mean, you know, hardly a groundbreaking result. But what I'm now going to do is I'm now going to get, I'm now going to differentiate with respect to beta. Um, or I'm actually going to differentiate the log of this z with respect to beta and minus it. I hope you guys can see why I'm doing that. I am, in fact, trying to get the internal energy, which you guys should hopefully have guessed so um so log of all this stuff right here um well let's go instead of writing it all out we can be a little bit smarter about this um we've got four products right here we've got this multiplied by this multiplied by this multiplied by this um now what are we doing we're differentiating with respect to beta so how many of these terms actually have beta in? Well, only this one right here. So um, you can immediately see that we're actually only going to be differentiating um, this pi over b to the power of 3n. So we're going to be differentiating the log of that. So the 3n is going to get pulled out the front along with this minus. And we've got the minus sign there. Um, and we're going to have the derivative of pi over beta um, and the three ends come out the front so this is all we're, all we're differentiating with respect to um, you know because all of this stuff this is not going to go through the integral uh, if this is not going to go through the differential um, 
you know, because there's no beta term in it. So, yeah, and I'll just write out what this is. We're trying to derive what the internal energy is of uh, of this partition function. So, <clears throat> let's go ahead and differentiate uh, the log of pi of beta. Um, so what is it? We're going to get u is equal to minus 3n um, log of pi over beta. Well, what's going to happen? Um, you're going to get the pi over beta on the bottom. Um, and using the chain rule, we're going to get minus pi over beta squared. So it's exactly the same as what we did before. Uh, and likewise, the pi's cancel. One of the betas cancel. The minus signs cancel. And what do we end up with? Well. 3n divided by beta and of course this is a bit more familiar as 3n kbt so there we go we've derived what the internal energy is but you're probably thinking to yourself well what what have you really done exactly you really haven't proved very much and that's fair enough but look at what we've got a little closer we've got this 3 right here where did this 3 come from exactly? Well, this 3 came from here, and this came from when you were taking uh, taking the square root of pi over beta to the power of 6. So this, of course, this pi over beta is simply raised to the power of a half, and the 6 made it into a pi over beta cubed. So that, that's where the 3 came from. Um, so the 3... What I should act, what what would actually be a bit clearer is to write it as one half multiplied by six n multiplied by kbt. Now, I've, of course, I've written exactly the same thing, but it's actually much clearer uh, to see what I've where this has come from um, if I write it like this. So, where's this six n come from? Because that's the thing that's giving the three. Well look at how many terms are in this Hamiltonian. There were six terms in the Hamiltonian and this turned into six integrals right here and this these six integrals made this uh, term raised to the power of six which then led it on, on for it to be divided by three and it led to the final result of this internal energy for this uh, Hamiltonian to be 3n kbt. And so what have we shown? Well, we have shown that every degree of freedom, that every degree of freedom contributes one half kbt, one half kbt units of energy. So we have n particles and six degrees of freedom for each particle. So the total number of degrees of freedom for the whole part for the whole system is 6n and we've shown that the energy is simply one half is simply 3n kbt and so we've now identified that if you divide the energy by the number of degrees of freedom we get one half kbt and so here we go and so we've now shown that the energy per degree of freedom is one half kbt um, and that follows and that is pretty useful for uh, if you want to know the energy of uh, a monatomic ideal gas a diatomic ideal gas or you know maybe even a multi-atomic ideal gas um, you know you can just simply substitute in the number of degrees of freedom and because of the equipartition theorem you know the internal energy because the energy is distributed evenly and so another way of phrasing the equipartition theorem is that every quadratic degree, every quadratic term in the Hamiltonian contributes one half kbt of energy to the system. Um, and that is a very well known result. Uh, it's a pretty useful result and you can apply it quite easily. So let's go ahead and apply this to a couple of different things. So we've got the ideal gas, first of all. Um, how many degrees of freedom are there in an ideal gas? Well, there's three degrees of freedom. You've got the x, y, and z degrees of freedom. Um, that This is per particle, of course. If you're talking about n particles, then you're just simply going to multiply it by n. So what's the internal energy? Well, uh, we're going to have a half kbt 
multiplied by the number of particles multiplied by the number of degrees of freedom per particles and you can easily see that this is just going to be 3 over 2 n kbt which is of course the ideal gas internal energy which we already knew but what about for a diatomic ideal gas well how many more degrees of freedom does that have? Well, let's go ahead and draw it out. Let's draw, it out, draw out our diatomic molecule. Well, we're going to, of course, still have the three uh, degrees of freedom, like the up and down, the left and right, and the in and out. Kind of hard to do on a 2D surface. But, yeah, we're still going to have the three same uh, degrees of freedom as before. But we actually also get rotational degrees of freedom because these molecules are actually free to spin around each other. And if I just draw a set of axes, um, I can actually clearly label uh, in what way they are rotating. So here's like the up and down direction. Here's like the, here's one axis right here. These molecules, um, they could be either rotating along this plane right here, or, kind of hard to draw, they could either be rotating in this plane right here. So I hope you guys can see um, see what's happening. There are basically two ways in which the um, in which these molecules can rotate. Uh, now you're probably thinking, wait, hang on, there's three. Uh, what if they just simply spin? Um, what if they just simply spin around their own axis, if you like? Well, the thing is um, that that has almost no moment of inertia. If you think about, if you treat these as point particles, which turns out to be a pretty good approximation, then there's gonna be no moment of inertia if the particles spin like that, because there's you know no sort of, no radius. Um, the moment of inertia is simply mr squared, or integral uh, mr squared, if you want. Um, and if there's no r, if all the all the mass is at the center, then you're not going to get any moment of inertia, and therefore you're going to get no rotational energy. Um, if you want the formula for the kinetic energy of a rotating object, it's actually L squared, where L is the angular momentum, divided by 2i, where i is the moment of inertia. So, and this is actually really similar to the kinetic energy for a translational um a translational particle, which is of course p squared over 2m. In rotational terms, um, the p sort of has an equivalence with l, and the m sort of has an equivalence with the i. So it's kind of like there's a rotational version of every uh, every term in uh, in classical mechanics. And so uh, this right here, this is your quadratic degree of freedom for your Hamiltonian. And so what are we going to get with a diatomic gas? Well, we're going to get an extra two, because of course one of them is redundant, degrees of freedom. So three translational, two rotational. How many is that? Well, that's five. There's going to be five degrees of freedom for a diatomic gas. And so U, the internal energy, is rather than three over two NKBT, we're actually going to get five over two NKBT. So, you know, these two extra degrees of freedom mean that the, there are two additional ways in which the energy can be shared uh, amongst all of the system. So there we go. That is what it would be for a diatomic ideal gas. When we derive that from the equipartition theorem, you could, of course, derive it in the classical way, but this way is a bit nicer. And I hope you guys can see why there's only five and not six, because uh, one of the axes is redundant. But um, yeah, there are uh, the internal energy is five over two NKBT for a diatomic gas. And finally, the last thing I'm going to look at in this video is the specific heat capacity uh, and what's called the Dulong Petit Law, uh, which you can derive, now that we derive the equipartition theorem, we can directly derive the Dulong Petit Law. Now, the Dulong Petit Law basically is all about what the heat capacity is for a solid. Um, I know we've been talking a lot about gases so far, 
But actually, if you think about what a metal is, I'm um, just going to draw out a metal, then you can kind of consider it as a as a, like a lattice right here. So you've got your um, your ions right here embedded within the lattice. Uh, so you're going to get some big 3D structure, which I'm kind of getting a bit lazy about when it comes to drawing it. So you're going to have your positively charged ions, and you're also going to have your electrons just floating about in the metal right here and when we come on to talk about this in a bit more detail we're actually going to be talking about the free electron model uh, and this is what this is um, and it's basically the electrons are kind of free within the metal uh, and therefore they actually behave just like a gas um, if they're just sort of particles whizzing around in a container that sounds like a gas doesn't it so these um, so these particles they don't interact with each other and they don't interact with the metal ions in the free electron model and the Dulong Petit law uses the free electron model to state what the heat capacity is. Now this is also assuming that the heat capacity only comes from electrons. Uh, you also get things called phonons which when which we're also going to go into. Um, and phonons are another cause of heat capacity and phonons are actually the reason why this law actually technically isn't correct uh, for low temperatures um, but yeah we're going to get into all that in a lot more detail later on we're just going to talk about the Dulong Petit law uh, for the moment which you can get directly from the equipartition theorem so what is the Dulong Petit law? well we know that U, the internal energy, is a half kBT multiplied by the number of degrees of freedom. So how many degrees of freedom are there? Well, there's going to be three positional degrees of freedom and three momentum uh, degrees of freedom. Remember, there are six terms in that quadratic uh, for the Hamiltonian. So we're actually going to get six degrees of freedom per particle, and each particle and we're going to have n particles in the in in the quote unquote gas right here. So here we go. U is three n k b t. And so what is the heat capacity? Well, this really couldn't be more, much more simple. You simply differentiate uh, with respect to temperature. So C V is d u by d t, which is equal to three nkb and if you only consider the molar <clears throat> heat capacity so little cv remember we use little cv as the molar heat capacity and that is big cv divided by n the number of moles that is equal to 3 nkb divided by little n what's big n divided by little n that's simply the avogadro number What's KB divided by the Avogadro number? What's KB multiplied by the Avogadro number? Well, that's going to be R, just 3R. So, and what is 3R? Well, that's just, what? That's like 24, about 24.9 joules per mole per Kelvin. And that is basically saying that the heat capacity of a metal is in fact a constant and it's saying that doesn't matter what the material is it if you have one mole of a metal then all metals should have a heat capacity of 24.9 joules right well unfortunately that is not true um not all he, not all metals have a heat capacity of 24.9 joules per mole per kelvin um, in fact, this is only true for very high temperatures, and we're talking temperatures sort of around 500 Kelvin, um, and even so, that's not true of all metals. So this law is actually wrong for high temperatures, and what I can actually do is plot, uh, plot a graph of uh, the heat capacity, CV, um, this is going to be the molar heat capacity right here, so this is little cv, against uh, the temperature. And what you'll, what you'll find is that most metals, they actually do something a bit like this. They do this, and then they tend to 
they tend to flatten off right here. And this limit right here, this is 24.9 or 3R if you like. But as you can clearly see, it's not 3R in this part of the graph at all. Um, it's quite a bit less. And so we're actually gonna go on to two different heat capacity models using this. Um, we're gonna go on to the Einstein model for heat capacity. Uh, which get which predicts the right heat capacity for high temperatures uh, But unfortunately it doesn't get the heat capacity right for this part of the diagram and for that we need to go to the Debye model of heat capacity and This the Debye model does get the heat capacity correct for low temperatures the heat capacity at low temperature is proportional to the cube of the temperature which is why this kind of looks like a cubic graph at the, ba at the base right here. But the Debye model also gets it right for upper temperatures as well. So the Debye model is actually the best model for heat capacity. And we'll be going on to that in a couple of episodes time. So, but anyway, all that is just an example as to what you can do with the equipartition theorem. Um, and that pretty much wraps it up for the n particle partition function. And yeah, so, in the next section, we are going to be carry on with statistical physics, but we're going to actually be talking about, we're actually going to be combining this with quantum mechanics, and uh, we're going to be, rather than treating particles as distinguishable, which is what we've done so far, we're going to be treating them as indistinguishable, uh, because for pun particles in the quantum level are fundamentally indistinguishable. So yeah, done, done, done. That is what's to come. We're also going to be doing the grand canonical partition function in the grand canonical ensemble. We're also going to be doing the Einstein model and Debye model for heat capacity. So all that to look forward to. I'll see you guys in the next episode.